Hi, AP Chem students. This is Mrs. Johnson, and this is the last video series for this school year, so get excited about that. Um, so we're starting off talking about electrochemical cells, and the only thing tricky about Chapter 18 is the amount of new terminology that you're going to encounter. Uh, I encourage you to really take some time to get familiar with the words, as that's where most people go wrong. Uh, the concepts really aren't that tricky. So galvanic cells... These are not like a cell in the body. These are um, a setup like what's shown here that uses redox reactions to produce electrical current. And one other thing, make sure that you finished the lab before you start these notes. It'll make a lot more sense. So galvanic cells produce an electrical current via redox reactions. So metals or species that exchange electrons are separated into two beakers or half cells. And this should start sounding familiar from what we did in the lab. You had two separate containers with a strip of metal in each. Each of those was a half cell. Uh, when you connect everything, a redox reaction is going to occur spontaneously once the half cells are connected with a wire, and that's what we saw. You actually measured a voltage. So the Gibbs free energy for this kind of reaction, hopefully you realize, is negative. That's a spontaneous reaction and thermodynamically favorable. Thus, the K value for the reaction is going to be greater than 1. And these are the basics behind batteries. The half cells in batteries that you would put in a TV remote, for example, are just squished into a little different conformation, but this is the idea. They're separated into two half cells. So um, one thing that I do to remember the types of cells is think about galvanic. It has a V in the center. The other word for this is sometimes called voltaic cell. And voltaic means it produces voltage. So that V is my little reminder that this one is a spontaneously recurring, occurring reaction that produces voltage. The other type of cell is what is shown in the second image, that's an electrolytic cell. <clears throat> so an electrolytic cell, <clears throat> in an electrolytic cell, hopefully you realize from the picture the difference is that this cell is plugged in. What's happening here is that a redox reaction is driven or run by an external power source, an external uh, electric current. So the setup is very similar, but this time the Gibbs free energy for the reaction is going to be greater than zero. So this is a not thermodynamically favorable reaction. To get it to go, we have to apply a consistent source of energy. Um, this is useful for a few different things, like collecting oxygen um, and hydrogen gas from water, plating metals. So like, for instance... If you're wearing gold-plated earrings, um, that was probably, they were, might have been plated via electrochem, or via an electrolytic cell. Uh, the big one is obviously recharging batteries. This is exactly how we recharge batteries. We run a, a redox reaction that's non-spontaneous by plugging the battery in to get it to recharge. Okay, so we're focusing mostly on galvanic cells. There's a bunch of terms to know. Some of these may be familiar, some not. Each half cell contains an aqueous solution and a matching solid metal electrode. That should make sense from the lab. So for an example, if you have an aqueous solution of zinc nitrate, Zn, NO32, and a solid strip of metal, it's going to be zinc solid metal. <clears throat> and then oxidation occurs at the anode. So one of these half cells we call the anode, and one half cell we call the cathode, or one region. Um, one metal species is going to get oxidized, and remember oxidation is loss of electrons. And again, the half cell where this is, occurs is called the anode. I'm drilling this into your brain, saying this like every sentence, uh, saying this every way possible so that you hopefully remember it. Generally, when we draw galvanic cells, the anode is going to be on the left, but that's not always the case. <clears throat> so if we are looking at this galvanic cell here, let's add some labels to it. If this is the anode, we would have zinc, two plus ions here, and nitrate. I'm just going with the example that I put. So we'd have a zinc nitrate aqueous solution. Our metal would have to be zinc solid. And then <clears throat> what happens is that this metal piece is getting oxidized. Remember, oxidized is losing electrons. So electrons would be traveling through this wire to the other half cell. So E minus flow is in this direction. And this would be called the anode because things are getting oxidized here. So the other cell is called the cathode. 
and this is where reduction happens. So <clears throat> the metal species in the cathode is getting reduced, and remember that's gaining electrons. So the half cell electrode where reduction occurs, cathode. Reduction at the cathode. Do whatever you need to to get that in your brain. Oxidation at the anode. I usually remember it because oxidation and anode are both vowels, and so then reduction and cathode go together. So generally, cathode is on the right. So <clears throat> let's think about the one that we did in lab. The other metal species that we had was copper. So we had solid copper, and in solution, we had copper two plus ions, and I think we actually had sulfate in this case. It doesn't really matter. Um, we'll do sulfate here just to switch things up a little instead of nitrate. <clears throat> so remember, electrons travel to the copper uh, strip of metal, and then they are joined by the copper two plus ions. So the, this electrode gains mass, the zinc electrode loses mass, not because of losing electrons. Electrons don't have a measurable mass, but it's because of the ions that they're gaining and losing as a result. So in drawings, cathode's generally on the left. Notice here, um, this second picture is actually a better representation of what we did. Our half cells were inserted into each other, but we were using a porous um, membrane for one of our half cells instead of this setup here. This weird funky thing is called a salt bridge, and I'll show you one in class. This salt bridge is the, the connector between the, two, um, the, between the two half cells, and this is what you're mostly going to encounter in AP Chem problems. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these diagrams. So the wire that connects the electrodes allow electrons to flow from one half cell to the other, specifically from the half cell being oxidized to the half cell that's being reduced, or to the metal strip that's being reduced. So again, flow of electrons is always gonna be from anode to the cathode, right? That's because the spontaneous redox reaction is occurring. One species is getting oxidized, the other species is pulling the electrons away from it. So the other species, the one that's at the cathode, has a really strong pull for electrons. So a little bit more on the salt bridge. Here's another picture. It's a tube. It's filled with some sort of salt ions in an auger or some sort of solution. Um, <clears throat> so common salt bridge species would be NaCl or KNO3. So here's the purpose of the salt bridge. As the aqueous solutions in each half cell changes, and we saw that in the lab, remember, as one species gets oxidized, one species gets reduced, the uh, concentration of ions in the, the, the liquids also change. The salt bridge allows ions to travel from one half cell to another to balance out the charges. So what happens if we didn't have this salt bridge, if we didn't have our porous membrane in our lab setup, as the electron transfer happens, as the concentrations change in solution, one half cell would build up a very positive concentration and one half cell would build up a very negative concentration and the redox reaction would stop. Without that salt bridge balancing the charge, allowing the charges to stay similar to each other, um, <clears throat> the redox reaction and thus the electric current would stop. And we can discuss this more in class if you're having trouble visualizing it, but for now, that's the purpose of the salt bridge. So what's really important to note in this diagram, the only thing traveling through the salt bridge are the ions. The only thing traveling through the wire are the electrodes. So don't mix up what travels through where. That should make sense. We know that metal is an electric conductor. It allows electrons to flow. Okay, so a porous disc, it serves the exact same purpose as a salt bridge. Um, that's like what was shown in the previous image. It just allows uh, ions to flow through it. Okay, <clears throat> so remember, here's a close-up diagram of what's going on. The zinc solid is getting electrons pulled away from it by copper, right? <clears throat> as the zinc solid has electrons getting pulled away, the two plus ions are getting deposited into solution. So the zinc electrode is getting oxidized, so I'm gonna write oil here, and then this electron loses, uh, this, uh, excuse me, metal strip loses mass because, not the electrons are leaving, because the two plus ions are leaving and getting deposited into the solution right here, okay? The zinc two plus, is increasing, the amount of it in solution is increasing, so we get a more positively charged solution on the anode side. 
And then the half reaction, if we wanted to write the half reaction that's occurring here, we saw this a little bit in lab. We had solid zinc, and we must write states here. So solid zinc was being converted to Zn2 plus aqueous ions plus two electrons. That's how we would write the half reaction. This is showing oxidation because zinc is losing electrons. <clears throat> so on the other side, here we have electrons getting deposited on the copper cathode. So copper is building up a negative charge. What's going to join it but the positive copper ions from solution? Right, so this electrode is gaining mass as those copper 2 plus ions join up onto the copper. And it is reduction reaction happening. So I'll write rig here. And then in the solution, Cu2 plus concentration is decreasing. So the solution becomes negatively charged. Or a negative charge builds up. And then let's think about the half reaction happening here. So the half reaction for reduction is going to be copper 2 plus aqueous, because we have two, copper 2 plus ions joining up with the two electrons on the, the copper strip to make copper solid. And that should make sense as to why then this electrode is shown to be gaining mass because it's getting reduced. We can see the copper buildup. And then the other electrode is losing mass because it was getting oxidized. Last thing we'll talk about with this picture is the salt bridge. So because this, the left anode side is getting more positively charged, the solution is getting more positively charged, we have negative ions traveling into this solution. So chlorine ions from the salt, chloride ions from the salt bridge travel here to balance out the charge, keeping this charge neutralized. The positive species is going to go to the, the reduction cathode because the, <clears throat> the reduction, or excuse me, the cathode side is becoming more negatively charged, so we're going to balance that out with positive charges. Okay, lots of terminology for you to figure out. And then a couple of last things to note. The anode <clears throat> donates electrons to the cathode. Cathode is getting reduced. The anode loses mass and gains more positively charged metal ions in solution. Oops. And then the electron transfer from the anode to the cathode causes anode atoms to form aqueous ions, so the solution becomes more positively charged. To counterbalance this, the negative ions from the salt bridge are going to join the anode. At the cathode, we're gaining mass and removing positive metal ions from solution. So as the electrons build up in the cathode, they're joined by metal ions. This is reduction. The metal atoms deposit. The solution is then becoming more negatively charged because it's losing those positive charges. So what happens is that positive charges from the salt bridge travel to the cathode to balance it out. So in the cell shown, zinc is getting, is zinc is the anode, copper is the cathode. How do you decide which is which? This is where the table of standard reduction potentials at the front of your notes is going to come into handy, which we will talk about in future. So you have a practice problem here. Practice drawing a complete galvanic cell on your own. Try doing this without looking at the notes, and then write the half reaction for each cell, the direction of electron flow, the direction of salt bridge flow, whether each electrode gains or loses mass. Try doing this on your own. This is something that I would expect you to do on a quiz. And when you are ready to see the answer, unpause the video. So here's your correct answer, balanced equation. Check out my drawing. The one thing that I want to ask you as a challenge is how many electrons are getting transferred in this reaction in total. If you look at your half reactions, hopefully you're able to write that magnesium is losing two electrons, aluminum is gaining three electrons. So if we were to add these two half reactions together to get this overall reaction, how many electrons are getting transferred? Hopefully you see you'd have to multiply the magnesium by 3 and the aluminum by 2, so we would get 6E minus transferred. And this is where we'll stop.